Okay, quick time access. This is one of these stupid things that, that I think doesn't raise up in, uh, in academia very far because it sounds like an implementation problem. But it's a horrible implementation problem. Current time millis called, here's the trick, that's a B. Billions of times a second and some benchmarks. Some key benchmarks which customers pay real money or not according to what your score on. Okay, so this sucks. So billions of times a second means that you have to really optimize the heck out of it. And it's just actually common in all large style apps. People will call current time millis every time any kind of transaction like thing goes through to put timestamps over the place to track timing of events at the application layer. You do see millions of times a second in non-benchmarks. It's common, common case, right? Okay, so out of this comes this next thing that's sort of tricky. Real Java programs, they really expect that if thread ones call the current time millis comes up with a number and thread two comes with another number and one's less than the other, that there's a happens before relationship in the memory model. <laughs> Okay. That is not anyone's spec, but that's what really is expected. So this is a hidden piece of spec that you have to match. If one CTM is less than another, by God, all the stores that happened up to this guy have to be visible to this other guy over here directly. So how you make that work, it's hard. <laughs> um, and if you get it wrong, then people like say, oh, I timestamp this file and I happen to cache it in memory and I timestamp this file and I happen to cache it in memory and this time's less than that timestamp, so I'm going to go read my file contents out of cache and they get the wrong thing. Right? And so then they get all mad at you and they complain that your VM's busted. Whatever. Okay, fine. <laughs> so, and then x86 came along and said, we're going to fix this. We're going to have this TSC register. It's a tick counter thing. And you have a read TSC instruction, you go get it. And lo and behold, the value is not coherent across all CPUs, so it's useless because the two numbers are just different. They monotonically increase, but not. Consistently even, because you get like these low power modes where this one suddenly slows way down, this one's marching up at a faster rate. Or you have context switching, where the OS isn't switching the TSC register with the threads back and forth, but even so, they're still not coherent across CPUs and they take at different rates and they drift and all kinds of horrible things. So TSC is essentially useless for this problem. Um, if you go to like Linux fastest user mode get time of day call, which is this uh, mostly user mode, mostly atomic, go read this structure and and you get a nice quality thing, and it's unfortunately it's like 100 clock cycles, which sounds like that's pretty cheap, except when you're doing it a billion times a second, you care. So the sort of right way to do this is you want to do a plain load that's been updated a thousand times a second by a background thread. It's popping a word in memory a thousand times a second, right? 10%. It's like, oh, Jesus. Well, I don't have to do this thing. Oh, fine. Then another problem with TSC registers, hypervisors love to say, ooh, we're going to make an idealized TSC register because the real one sucks so bad. So we're going to make it monotonically increasing and uniform, monotonically increasing, and of course that means they're trapped in the hypervisor time you talk to the TSC, so it's a thousand times slower than their plain old TSC. And only some hypervisors do it, and only under some flag, so if you're running on x86, you have no clue what the TSC register means. So that's my rant on Intel, if there's any Intel people. Okay, illusions that we think we have, but we don't, <laughs> or we wish we had. <laughs> All right, like to have infinite stack, tail calls, right? Some functional languages just want to do looping via call, 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 tail call, tail call optimizations. Probably should happen at some point. Running code is data, uh -uh, i.e., closures, right? And I think that's also going to happen at some point. I think Brian will jump up and down and say, yeah, closures are coming, finally, 10 years late, okay, fine. Um, integer, capital I integer is as cheap as lowercase int. And by that I'm sort of meaning auto boxing optimizations. There are some out there that's still pretty weak compared to the usage model which people are having where they want to, you know, take a lowercase int, treat it as a first class citizen, makes function calls against lowercase int, for which you have to auto box to capital I int and yada yada yada. And then you get a million allocations a second of capital I ints and you have allocation rate issues and stuff. Big int, like tag integer math, like overflow, it really um, needs to be optimized in the JIT as a first class citizen, you know, the overflowing, the lowercase n, you're never going to get at a Java language implementation level the kind of efficiency you can get if you're using tag map. Uh, atomic multi-address update, i.e. software transactional memory. A bunch of people claim this is going to save the world for concurrent programming. I'll disagree, but I won't say you can't have it because I actually don't know if it'll save the world or not. Um, be nice if it does. So, you know, people are asking for it. Who knows, right? Fast alternative call bindings. This is like invoke dynamic. This is, you know, the JRuby 
uh, folks who want to have different lookup rules than Java's standard invoke virtual, invoke interface lookup rules, um, but they want all the other uh, JVM optimizations that make uh, dynamic calls fast as static calls. And so they want to have some tricks. They want to be able to borrow some of the JVM's tricks. And for that, they need deep hooks into the JVM. So here's a, an illusion we think we have, that this mass of code is maintainable. <laughs> it's uh, approaching 15 years old since I've been aware of it. I know Dave's got some, I know some of it was pre-existing even before that. Like I think the class load or the system dictionary, some of those parts predated coming into yeah, it, Sun by a goodly amount. Yeah, it goes back to 87, I think. Okay. When we started the selfie. Yeah. Okay, so that makes it, some chunks are 20 years old and more. So, yeah. And uh, at large chunks of the code are very fragile in the sense that, oh, well, just fragile. Changes there often have subtle bugs, and it's hard to track down and find. And you really have to have somebody who's a real expert in sort of all the little corner cases that depend on this thing behaving just that way. Um, and so you just can't go in and hack stuff. Or also you get stuff where people um, sort of don't know all the invariants that are maintained by the VM, and so they can't re uh, recreating invariants that are already there, and they do this by adding more and more and more layers of code, which all in the end do nothing useful because the invariants are already there. And, and so you get these very fluffy line per line of code kind of behavior. And so the rate of change, the feature, new feature rate of change has been very slow for a while. And I, of course, I've been having fun hacking away. One of the fun things about being a startup is that no one has, can, can say no to me. And so I've been wailing away on uh, on a version of Hotspot now based on the OpenJDK, but we have huge changes. <coughs> Uh, and many of the major subsystems we replaced lots and lots and lots of them. Um, thread priorities. Uh, people like to think that we have thread priorities. Uh, it all works, sort of, kind of, if you don't look too closely at it. But once you look closely at it, it turns out it doesn't work at all. Um, really, you can't get thread priorities uh, on a lot of OSs without root permission because you can't elevate, right? You can only lower. But if you lower, then you end up lowering yourself relative to all the other things on the same box. And that's not the sort of the expected case where I want to have my typical threads running at the typical priority. And some threads are more important, some are less. I can't do that unless I go get root permission, right? But then I also get this issue where the priorities are relative to an entire machine, not just to one JVM, which means I might have a low priority JVM, one that's just running some background thing I want it to get done eventually. But he has occasional high priority threads, such as, for example, concurrent GC threads that are trying to keep up with his allocation rate. And so they have to run at a higher priority than the mutator threads in this low priority JVM in order to get some cycles to clean up ahead of them. But these higher priority GC threads now end up starving out the standard worker threads and another more important JVM who may be doing some web front thing, which I'm going to clicky clicky and make money by making a sale, except that I got stalled because my low priority batch process is eating all my cycles. Um, so there are thread priority issues here. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. Write once, run anywhere. It's as close to true on Java as I've seen it on any language on the platform. But in fact, scale matters. Programs that are designed for very small machines look very different from programs that are designed very, for very large machines. And that's just the way it goes. If you try to move one onto the other, you'll get some really sucky stuff. Finalizers are useful. I came to whale on finalizers for a minute. They suck for reclaiming OS resources. Because they don't have timeliness guarantees. The time finalizer eventually runs. Eventually. But maybe eventually is never. So for instance, we've hacked into the JVM that Tomcat, when he runs into an out of file handle situation, he triggers a full GC to reclaim finalizers. So you know, recycle OS file handles. That is, the GC heuristics and algorithms have a special hook that says, I'm out of file handles, trigger full GC cycle. Just like, wait a minute, guys. This is like separation of concerns here. How many other out of OS resource situations also need to trigger GC? Am I doing graphics? Do I need to reclaim graphics memory? Do I need to reclaim external buffers? Do I have uh, you know, big table uh, memcache things where I've got giant memory chunks of non you know, Java heap that need to be reclaimed? How many other ways do I need to go Tell the GC, go run now so I can get my finalizers run. Right? Do we run our program uh, or run our programs that way? Uh, my claim is no. GC should manage the Java heap, not the external resource heap. Weak soft phantom refs, another 
thing where you're trying to use GC to manage some sort of user mode resource. In this case, it's usually Java managed caches. And you get into this scenario where you're getting low on memory. So you have some rapid GC cycles, which cause all your soft rush to flush, which means your caches get emptied, which means you get more cache misses on your running app, which the app has to redo all the work that didn't get cached. So it has to do more allocation, which causes rapid GC cycles. And I have seen this failure mode time and time again. And it's one of these sort of bimodal things in production. You have an identical load on two identical JVMs on two identical machines. And the, the load's bobbling up and down. This one gets into a little bit of a low memory situation for a little bit of a memory spike. And then it falls over into this thing. And suddenly, it's GCing constantly, doing running at 99% CPU, barely keeping up. Um, and the other one is taking the same load, but it's using like 10% CPU, and the GC cycles are extremely rare, and it's because its caches are working, and the other one's caches aren't, and there's no recovery. And it's the same load on both of these JVMs. It's bimodal. You have two different stable running modes, one of which sucks and one of which doesn't. And that's because soft refs are a lousy way to manage caches. OK. Let's go sort all this stuff out. OK, so we have a bunch of services provided, kind of summarized here. JVMs giving me GC, jitting, Java memory model, some thread management, some fast time things. I'm making a bunch of stuff out of the OS, threads, context switching, you know, actual access to CPUs, right, thread priorities, or process priorities, file systems, virtual render protection. Above the JVM, I see stuff like thread pulls and work lists, transactions, basically models of concurrent programming, um, plus, plus you know, caching and crypto and actual work. Plus, in these alternative languages, bring in all kinds of other new features that are sitting above the JVM. And what can I look at them and, and make, what can I say about these set of services here? So, one of the first things I'd like to say is that I want to get a fast quality time pushed down into the OS. What the hell is the JVM doing in this business, right? The TSC register ain't doing it. And I get quality, but not fast enough from like get time of day. It's pretty fast, but not fast enough. So, I want some OS service which just takes a memory word a thousand times a second update with some kernel thread or some timer thingy, and make it read-only process shared, right? Every process on the entire box can go get a nice, high-quality current time of millis. And of course, because they're reading a word, um, it's, it's coherent across all your CPUs on a clock cycle, a clock cycle basis. It's perfectly coherent. Everyone agrees in what the current time is down to the last, you know, now second load that it happened. Thread priorities, as opposed to process priorities. So OSs provide priorities at the process level, right? And, and I agree with this, right? If I'm running multiple JVMs on a box, I, I think it's reasonable to say this JVM is doing a service which is important, and this one's doing one that's less important, and I can prioritize them and like one starve out a lower one if he needs to. Fine. But within a JVM, I need thread priorities that are relative within that JVM. So I need to be able to run my GC threads if they're concurrent before the mutator threads you know, run out of memory, or else my concurrent GC won't be concurrent because the, mutator, the concurrent GC threads are all starved out, and eventually the mutator blocks because I ran out of memory. Right, fine. Same thing with a JIT. If I run Volano, Volano Mark, any of that style things, I get 1,000 runnable threads. If everyone's running the same priority, I got one JIT thread, 1,000 runnable threads, the JIT thread gets one 1,000th one of the CPU time, essentially he starves, and the program ends up running interpreted the entire time. So the JITs also need higher priorities, or they'll get starved out by the, the Java threads. So there are services within a JVM that need to be higher priority than the Java threads themselves uh, in order to provide all the other illusions that the Java threads expect. Um, but these should be lower than any other process which is running at a higher priority. So it's a different kind of, different notion of priorities. It's a hierarchical notion of priorities. Yeah. 